Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 197 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And in this conflict, we hit a new milestone as over 50,000 soldiers fighting for Russia have been killed so far in this conflict. This number doesn't include wounded in action, missing in action, or prisoners of war. And for those out there that support Russia, they think this number is laughable and they argue there's no way that 50,000 Russian soldiers have been killed so far in this conflict. These numbers being put out by Ukraine's defense ministry are absolute nonsense. And if you notice, there was a difference in the wording. Ukraine is not claiming that 50,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. Ukraine is claiming that 50,000 soldiers fighting for Russia have been killed. And I'm going to explain the difference for you quickly in this video. And to understand the discrepancy in this number, you have to realize the Russian separatist forces from the Donbass region make up a large percentage of the soldiers fighting for Russia. So we're talking about the Donetsk People's Republic, DPR, and Luhansk People's Republic, LPR. These are the breakaway regions that no one recognizes. And when you go on their Wikipedia page and look up what is their standing military, in 2021, prior to the invasion, it was 44,000 active duty personnel. So if Russia invaded Ukraine with 200,000 of their own soldiers, plus the DPR, LPR fighters, that's another 44, that's close to a quarter million soldiers. However, this number of 44,000 was prior to general mobilization. So Russian-backed separatist leaders declare full civilian military mobilization. This was on February 19th, five days before the war began. And of course, uh, let's see here. Russian-backed separatist leaders declared a full military mobilization in the separatist areas of Donetsk and Luhansk and ordered the evacuation of civilians to Russia. They accused Ukraine of planning an invasion of rebel-held territory. Of course, Ukraine denies it. So what are the population numbers for these regions? And we'll look just at the city centers. These are the capital of the regions. So for the city of Luhansk, it had a pre-war population close to about 400,000. For the city of Donetsk, it's much larger with a pre-war population close to 900,000. So when you think about the controlled territory prior to this war beginning in February, we'll just use nice round numbers and assume that the population in this area is about 1.5 million people. So if 1.5 million people existed in this region from the beginning, let's assume, once again, nice round numbers, that about 500,000 of these people either fled west to get back into Ukraine or fled east to get into Russia to avoid this conflict. That leaves 1 million people remaining in this uh, Russian-occupied rebel territory. Let's go ahead and assume 500,000 or half of them are women, and Russia is not going to force conscript them. So that leaves 500,000 men from this region. Let's go ahead and say that 250,000 of them are too young or too old or already have an essential government service job like police officer or firefighter and they're exempt from general mobilization. So how many men of able-bodied age from the separatist region was Russia able to conscript and force mobilize and the number has to be close to 250,000. We don't have the official number because the DPR and the LPR are not going to tell anyone, and Russia's keeping their mouth shut. But when you think about what was the true scale and size of this invasion for the Russian forces, Russia invaded Ukraine with closer to a 500,000 soldier army. This includes the Russian conscripts, the Russian contract soldiers, all of the DPR, LPR conscripts, maybe close to 250,000 of them. This also includes the, Wag the Wagner mercenaries, and when they die, Russia doesn't count that as one of their soldiers dying, because these are private contract soldiers. 
There's also the Chechen National Guard and any Syrian fighters that happen to show up. So when Ukraine claims that they killed a soldier fighting for Russia and they've killed about 50,000, they're counting everyone. They're counting the DPR, LPR, the Wagner mercenaries, the Chechens, the Syrians, whoever. Someone fighting for Russia that they took out, they're going to claim credit for that. So what percentage of this number is actual Russian military deaths? Let's, I'm just going to assume half. So maybe Russian military proper, conscripts and contract soldiers. Maybe the Russian military has lost 25,000 soldiers. But when you look at this number and this ratio after six months of fighting, if there was a total invasion force close to 500,000 with general mobilization, then yeah, 50,000 dead after six months, that seems very realistic given how horrible the Russian military has been fighting this conflict so far. They've not had a good strategy, good tactics, or a good plan, and there's no end in sight to this conflict. Russia cannot achieve their military objectives. Additionally, the mobilization of the occupied territories has never stopped. There's lots of pictures and videos of young men in the occupied areas being grabbed off the streets and told, congrats, you're now a soldier, you're going to get three days of training, and then we're going to send you to the front lines. Here's a story about residents in the occupied city of Melitopol. This is near Zaporizhia. And they accepted Russian passports, Russian citizenship, and they're now receiving orders to sign up for military service. They're being told these are Ukrainian citizens in the occupied regions near Kherson, Zaporizhia, Melitopol, Kharkiv. If they accepted a Russian passport and Russian citizenship, they're now being told, congrats, you're a soldier, you gotta go to war and fight. And with these separatist fighters, um, these are all Ukrainian citizens, they're being given the least amount of training, the least amount of support from the proper Russian military, and they're being given the worst equipment. Lots of hilarious videos online of, for example, their body armor, which can easily be pierced by bullets, their helmets, which you can easily punch in with your fist, and the Russian military is issuing them Mosin rifles. This is a rifle that was designed in the 1800s. This is the equipment being given to these separatist fighters uh, from the Donbass region. Now, yes, I know the Mosin rifle was a perfectly acceptable gun during World War II to fight the Nazis, but warfare has changed in the last 70 years, and Russia is not even giving these fighters proper assault weapons. There's been lots of pictures and videos of these separatist fighters openly mutinying against Putin. This was a story from earlier this summer where a commander from a DPR unit complained his men had been thrown into bloody combat without food, without proper equipment, without medicine, and many of the soldiers in his unit have chronic health issues. There are no medical exemptions if you have a bad back, if you have diabetes, if you have cancer, doesn't matter. Russia's going to give you a Mosin rifle and then tell you to go to the front lines. So in effect, what is happening here is through forced conscription, Russia is killing the entire male adult population of the occupied Donbass region. These are not Russians. These, these people belong to independent republics, according to Russia. So they can force mobilize them and then tell them to do anything they want. They are completely at Russia's mercy. And Russia has been using them brutally on the front lines because Russia views this as a win-win. These are Ukrainian citizens from the Donbass region. And if you push them to the front, then it's Ukrainians killing Ukrainians. For Russia, they view that as a win-win. And for hundreds of years, the Russian Empire has been doing this, force conscripting minorities that are not proper Russians, sending them to war to kill them off, and then later repopulating these regions, repopulating this territory with proper ethnic Russians from 
Moscow or St. Petersburg, people loyal to the Tsar, loyal to Putin, loyal to the Russian Empire. This has been their playbook for hundreds of years. So let's now check in on the front lines and how this war is going. Ukraine situation report, Russian forces being chipped away along multiple fronts now. Ukrainian and U.S. officials report good news from Ukrainian forces' actions against Russian occupiers along multiple fronts. So what is the multiple front? Everyone has already been hearing about the Kherson front all summer. And surprise! There is now a Kharkiv counteroffensive beginning, and there are major indications that Ukraine has opened up a second offensive front in the northeast as its operation in the south also continues to gain ground. So President Zelensky finally has spoken to the nation about the recent counteroffensive operations, but doesn't want to disclose specifics. But he said this week we have good news from the Kharkiv region, adding it is not the time to name the places to which the Ukrainian flag is returning, but he wanted to by name thank specific uh, Ukrainian units. So here is the internet's, re internet's reaction, the reaction on Twitter. All summer we've been talking about and waiting for this Kherson offensive, and surprise, we've got amazing pictures and videos coming out of the counteroffensive in the Kharkiv region. So here is, uh, here's what's been going on. The Ukrainian move to draw Russian forces into Kherson is clearly one of the greatest strategic moves of the war so far. It brought some of the best Russian military units into Kherson, where they can't be resupplied and are being methodically grinded down. And it's made the Russian units thinner uh, along the front line in other regions, specifically Kharkiv. So when we look at the war map, there really is four fronts. There's the Kherson front on the north bank of the uh, Dnieper River. There's the Zaporizhia front with the Zaporizhia front, which I think neither side really feels is to their advantage to advance at this time. I think this will become a more serious and uh, contested area in the near future, but right now neither side seems to be fighting that hard. Then there's the Donbass front, which Russia cares the most about. Their stated objective is to get to this dotted gray line, and since taking the city of Severodonetsk and Lysychansk over two months ago, they've made no significant progress on the ground. The Wagner mercenaries are in charge of this uh, advance because Russia thinks their offensive capabilities is the best. So the Forgotten Front, the front that maybe Russia was not paying attention to, was the Kharkiv Front up here. And they chose to staff this region with their least capable, least trained, least motivated troops, which are the DPR and LPR separatists. So when we zoom into this region, I'll just show you how the war map on Deep State Map Live have been, has been changing. And we'll go back in time a couple days just so you can see how the front has been changing. I think uh, the Ukrainians started making moves closer to around the 5th or 6th. So let's go back. All right, here we are. This is September 5th. We'll then jump ahead to the 6th. And you can see there was a little blob of land that the Ukrainians uh, retook there. We'll now switch it to the 7th uh, at the end of the day. And they pushed in. I mean, this is over 10 kilometers in a single day. We'll now swap this to, uh, let's see here, the 8th at the end of the day. And a huge advance going in to retake this road. And you can see uh, they're firmly in control of this territory. And if you believe all of this is uh, Ukrainian propaganda, it's Russian media sources that have been reporting on this. Russian media sources confirm the encirclement of Russian forces in the Kharkiv Oblast. Their front lines are completely collapsing. Lots of fantastic pictures and videos. Let me share this one of you of a Soviet battle flag. Uh, the Russian military still flies these. 
being taken down by Ukrainian forces in a liberated village. That has to feel good after all the terrible things the Russian military has done. And these lines collapsed so suddenly, uh, soldiers were either captured or retreated, leaving behind a lot of their equipment. Lots of pictures and videos by the Ukrainian military of ammunition and equipment and weapons that they've captured. They'll be put to good use. Lots of artillery pieces and munitions, once again, also left behind. My suspicion is that within a week or so, these will be used on the Russian forces themselves. Lots of uh, POWs being taken in, Russian soldiers either surrendering or being taken by force. And I'll show you a clip of a video just to give you an impression of how young these soldiers are. Uh, the men in this truck, they look like they're 18, 19, 20 years old. Anyone who's 22 years old or younger, that, that's Russian, they've only ever lived in Putin's Russia. They've been subjected to 22 years of Kremlin propaganda, pro-Putin propaganda, and the only reason why they would continue to fight is if they actually did suspect or believe that they were the good guys and that Europe is full of Nazis and they had to invade Ukraine to protect Russia, but these young men are going to be taken to a POW camp and then finally told the truth that they're the bad guys. They're the ones who invaded their peaceful neighbor and have been committing war crimes. Сука, блядь, я охуенею, парни, блядь. Разлани, граждане вы, какой, блядь, краины? Або. Какой краины? Россияне. Россияне, россияне. Россияне. Из какой частины откуда? Откуда? Блин, расходы. Вообще с Саратовым Я понял. Батьки, батьки есть? Батьки есть? To me, their faces say it all. I hope in time that they can learn the errors of their way, seek forgiveness, and find it on some level with, with Ukraine. Pivoting now to the Kherson front, uh, the Russians are at it again. This time, they're using a different location to attempt to ferry across supplies. The ferry at the Antonovsky Bridge, I think, got blown up. So they're trying to ferry across supplies at a different location. This isn't going to work. Additionally, they're also attempting to construct another pontoon bridge closer to the center of the city in Kherson. Once again, as soon as they complete building it, Ukraine is just going to blow it up again. I, I don't even know why they're bothering when it is impossible to stop these high Mars missiles. So you can see where they're attempting to ferry across now, also where they're attempting to build a new pontoon bridge. This is closer to the city proper so that the uh, Russian military here can be uh, more directly resupplied. Having to go to the Antonovsky Bridge up here, you can see it's a bit more of a drive. I don't know if a ferry is capable of kind of getting up this smaller river in this marshland, but... Maybe they're having to drive it to a loading dock uh, somewhere right here and then get it across. This is completely futile. The Ukrainians are going to keep blowing up these pontoon bridges, complete, com uh, continue blowing up these ferries. Russia cannot get their forces resupplied on the north bank of this river. And here's the ultimate indicator that Russia is struggling, that Russia is getting desperate. According to U.S. intelligence, Russia is now buying millions of rounds of artillery ammunition from North Korea. One, if it was produced in North Korea, I would be dubious of the product quality. I wouldn't trust it. But I don't even think North Korea makes their own artillery shells. 
So this means that North Korea's stockpiles of artillery, they either got it from the Chinese or they got it from the Russians. And it would be a sweet irony, uh, an absolute hilarity if North Korea 20 or 25 years ago bought all of this artillery ammunition from the Russians and decades later they're now selling it back to them probably at a considerable markup to make some short-term profit. But if Russia is desperate enough to uh, ask, be asking the North Koreans for artillery ammunition, this means their own stockpiles are depleted. They've already taken Belarus's stockpiles. They've already taken uh, equipment and munitions from Syria. They're already begging the Iranians for help, asking for those drones. This does not look good for Russia's long-term military capability to continue fighting this war. Let's now wrap up this video with a feel-good story, as there was a chimpanzee from the Kharkiv Zoo that escaped his habitat, and he was walking around the city while zoo employees were trying to convince him to return to the zoo. It was only when it started to rain that the chimpanzee ran to a zoo employee to get a jacket, and then agreed to return to the zoo. The chimpanzee agreed to return to the zoo. That's pretty adorable and a reminder that lots of animals have been suffering in this war as well as the Russian military continues to shell and bomb the city of Kharkiv. It's impossible for animals like this chimpanzee to understand what is happening to them. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to sh uh, support my channel. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.